Welcome to The Sword and the Trowel, a podcast of Founders Ministries. Founders Ministries exists for the recovery of the gospel and the reformation of churches. I'm Jared Longshore. And I'm Tom Askell. And this is... I'm Tom Nettles. Tom Nettles. Welcome, Tom. It's great to have you here with us in the Founders Studio. This is the first time I think we've had you. Uh, that we've been able to get you to sit down with us for a recording. So we I, appreciate feel, I feel elevated <laughs> by the company. <laughs> well, well, you'll get over that quickly. Okay. <laughs> so. I think he meant the, he probably meant the people around us. <laughs> stronger companies back there. Yeah, that's true. That's true. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses here. So, Tom, uh, thanks for coming. You're going to be pre- preaching at Grace Baptist Church here in Cape Coral uh, tomorrow on the Lord's Day. We're delighted for your willingness to come and do that. And um, we were talking earlier just about uh, some of the history of your own life and the way that uh, God has intertwined our lives. Uh, Jared was your student at Southern Seminary. Mm-hmm. When did you uh, study under Tom, Jared? Like three years ago or something, four years ago? Um, something like that. It's a little blurry, but... 2000. Well, I mean, I had you for both my master's work and doctoral work. So And finished your dissertation, uh, supposedly as my last student, but I've still had a couple of hangers on <laughs> after that. I wanted well, that honor so bad. Yeah, I yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I wrote an excellent dissertation on John Dagg and the principle of love. It's fundamental to his understanding of theology. It was great. Yeah, so, the, so he's like the uh, omega of Tom's... Um, teaching career. I was close to the alpha, not at the very beginning, but I was there at Southwestern back in 1979. You started teaching at at Southwestern. 76. I had your brother. That's right. My brother was your student as well. So, uh, it was, it was good to kind of look at the bookends of, of some of your early teaching ministry and then these latter years. So you Mm -hmm. right now are the senior professor of historical theology at Southern Seminary, which means you kind of retired, but you still uh, teach occasionally. Yeah, they've maintained that title for me. And that means that if they want me to teach a course and I want to teach a course, I'll teach up to one course per semester. And I've mm-hmm. done that most of the semester since I retired in 2014. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Well, Tom, tell us about uh, your background. You grew up in Mississippi, right? Well, Brandon, Mississippi, uh, 12 miles east of Jackson. That's where my mother's home was. And when she got married, they lived in my, my father and mother lived in Virginia for a while. He was in the Navy. It was World War II. And then uh, they moved back t- to Brandon. I was born there in 1946. Mm-hmm. And you have uh, siblings. I have uh, three siblings. I had an older sister, still ha- have an older sister, but she was already on on site when I came into the world. Mm-hmm. And then I have a younger sister and a younger brother. Okay, very good. So in Mississippi, you went to uh, Mississippi College? I graduated from Brandon High School, and then I went to Mississippi College, which is just uh, on the other side of Jackson, about eight miles, so about mm-hmm. 20 miles from my home. It's a Baptist school, and uh, I went there all four years, majored in Spanish, mm-hmm. and uh, then met my wife there, Margaret. Mm-hmm. We courted for three and a half years, married in July of uh, the year we graduated, 68, mm-hmm. and then moved to Southwestern Seminary, where I attended seminary. Very good. It, you, you played basketball in college, in high school? I played in high school. I played one year in in college, and uh, I got a bad case of bronchitis, and I was minoring in music, and my voice teacher told me I could either choose basketball or voice, but I couldn't do them both. And so you the Lord voice. gave me wisdom to choose, <laughs> <laughs> choose voice. There was a time when I said, I'm going for basketball. <laughs> well, I had good. already learned that year, though, that college basketball was a lot different from high school basketball. And even mm. when we were playing these junior colleges in Mississippi, the athletes were much more intense. And I, I knew I wasn't going to make it. <laughs> so it wasn't a big sacrifice. <laughs> it, was, it was an opportunity to save some embarrassment, for sure. <laughs> so uh, growing up in Mississippi in the 60s. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, I didn't realize what a momentous and historical time that was when I was coming up. But as I've been studying since then and aware of all the repercussions of those days and tried to wrap my own mind around it, it's uh, really quite overwhelming to realize what was happening as I was growing up, going to a segregated high school, uh, during the era after the Supreme Court had already commanded uh, integration and hearing teachers resist that and talk about 
you know, if we did that, one of my teachers had said, I'll stand behind the door with a baseball bat and bop them on the head when they come in. You know, it's uh, some brutal things. And this is, uh, I think this is in the conscience of many people who grew up in the South of those times. And so there are uh, sort of intrinsic appeals when people talk about justice right. in these areas. We, we realize, yeah, we do, we want justice. And, right. But by God's grace, I don't think that these are incurable prejudices. We grow up around them. We absorb them. They become just sort of part of the way we think. They become a part of our vocabulary. But once the gospel, once the theological realities come to bear upon a person's mind as to what's involved in such prejudices, and once we begin to see that most that the prejudices themselves simply are not true. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're caricatures, and we the, the Lord brings us out of that. And so sort of the, the atmospheric racism that I grew up with became incompatible with the way I thought about the gospel and with I began to learn when I began to think about theology and creation and redemption and things like that. I realized that that was just absurd. And I think it's in, in accordance with truth that God grants us uh, repentance and grants us sanctification in those, those areas. And so uh, I think that the gospel is, is the hope for the tensions that we still experience mm. in that. And nothing, nothing short of a full embracing of, of gospel truth will do it, but a full embracing of gospel truth will do it. Yeah, amen. And, uh, so you graduated from Mississippi College. Went I mean, to- just uh, not to see, I... I remember when I was there, the sto- Emmett Till, the Emmett yeah, Till yeah. event occurred. I remember reading about that. Medgar Evers was mm-hmm. assassinated. The five civil rights workers were killed in the Shoba County and buried in the dam. All of those mm-hmm. things were occurring. Freedom Riders came through. Uh, Brandon, I remember they parked right out in front of my daddy's store. He owned a, a Rexall drug store. And I remember seeing them. Uh, and so there, there's just a, a lot of dynamics that were occurring and, and there were probably some memorable, courageous statements that were made by ministers mm-hmm. in the town. We would consider them minimalistic now, right, but for right. that time they were courageous, and that, that was a part of sort of setting my mind, thinking about, thinking in a different direction about mm-hmm. those things. And I, I love to talk about Willie Mays and Leontine Price as, <laughs> as, as, as two people that, that helped me realize that the characters were wrong. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, if the greatest athlete in the world and the greatest singer in the world were African American, then it's just uh, impossible to maintain the characters yeah. about any kind of superiority. Yeah. And, and of course, combined with the gospel, of course, that was. So yeah, I just I, I, at the time I didn't realize just how formative and how powerful that kind of um, atmosphere was in which I was reared. I don't thank God for it from the standpoint of the. Uh, prejudices that were present. In his providence, though, I thank the Lord that I have that kind of personal acquaintance with the dynamics, understand uh, what's at stake, and what the cure is. So you left Mississippi, went to Texas Mm -hmm. for Southwestern Seminary, and you enrolled in... Southwestern Seminary in 1968, 68. all of 68. So what was the seminary like then? The seminary was the most evangelical. We had had the Elliott controversy in 61, the... uh, the, the, uh, Commentary. uh, Then the commentary came during my first... during the MDiv program there, but so the, these issues of biblical authority already were sort of atmospheric, and mm-hmm. uh, uh, Southwestern Seminary had the the um, reputation for being the most evangelical of all of, the southern of Baptist all the Southern Baptist seminaries, and and that word was around the guys at Mississippi College who were going into ministry. Some wanted to go to Southern because they would say, "Well, uh, I want to go and have my head filled," and others would say, "Well, I want to go and have my heart filled," and that was kind of the way we. <laughs> Did and so that was Southwestern and 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 Southern and um, many people went to New Orleans at that time uh, too and they had some some pr- fairly conservative men at New Orleans like Leo Edelman and and uh, Roy Beeman and mm. and some uh, uh, Clark Pinnock had had yeah, taught down time. there yeah at that time and uh, had had written a book called Set Forth Your Case that was an apologetics 
work that I had read even uh, like, I think maybe my last year in high school. But Southwestern was the place that was most appealing, and it was a great experience. I really enjoyed being at Southwestern. So you <coughs> enrolled in Southwestern. Um, when did you develop your love of history? Was it before that or during that time? Or? Um, well, I have to confess, it was late coming. I, I didn't have a love of history. I didn't have a love of reading. I didn't even understand the value of learning until my junior year in college. And had kind of an intellectual awakening and awakening and realized learning was important. And um, in the MDiv program, I wanted to, I majored in just focusing on electives in New Testament and Greek and Hebrew, mm -hmm. really knew the importance of the languages. The last year of the MDiv program, we had an interdisciplinary seminar where four teachers were together uh, and they all presented papers. And then the, uh, the students that were in that seminar also presented papers. And I was in the New Testament section and we did the synoptic problem, which was just one of the most laborious things that I had ever experienced at that time. But the man who was doing church history in the disciplines was a person who could participate in all the discussions. He had a historical grasp of everything that, was, that we were discussing at that time. And so I, I remember thinking about this. And one time he was talking and I be, began to look at him and I said, that's what I want to do. Hmm. Uh, and so... The whole the value of history came alive to me in that interdisciplinary seminar. Was that during, Robert Baker? No, that was W. R. E. Step. Oh, E. Step. Yeah. Okay. Who knows how no. would you articulate that value of history to somebody that's thinking about it now, going, okay, I, you got different ways to approach subjects and life. What is that value? Well, you don't know any subject unless you know it historically. You've, you've got to understand the historical flow. You can't know philosophy unless you know it historically. You've got to understand Greek philosophy. You've got to understand how that worked its way into, into Christian theology in many ways. You have to understand uh, the Enlightenment period and the different philosophical ideas that arose and how they either failed or succeeded and how they led to other philosophical ideas and how they impacted theology. And so uh, all of these, the, the sort of the, the intertwining of the disciplines, and you learn how they come together happens as you study them uh, historically. Uh, you know, if you, you just look, for example, you look at historical criticism as just a method of interpretation without understanding the philosophical background behind it, then you're going to, to think that there are no values that are built in to this, mm. this method of interpretation. Uh, but there are all kinds of assumptions about truth and about history and about literature that, that, that begin to be pressed into that particular theory. If you know it historically, then you have a, a better chance of, of dealing with it. So uh, I don't say that history is superior to biblical interpretation and people who want to go into New Testament and Old Testament, I, that's just, that's great. And that's, that is the, the primary way in which we come to understand truth is through real, uh, a credible interpretation of scripture. Systematic theology, I would think is, is sort of, is next. And it's the synthesis of all the biblical exposition that we do and which we try to organize the, uh, the different disciplines or the different doctrines that arise out of Scripture into, into distinct and discrete doctrines to help us understand, and then that itself becomes a tool for interpretation. Uh, but then supporting all of that is the historical uh, discipline. And if a person can school themselves in systematic theology and biblical interpretation, then I think there is a value in having a lot of formal study in history because it it then helps you with these other, mm. these other disciplines. So how did, you, uh, how did you begin to teach at Southwestern? Did, did you teach as a Ph.D. student there? No, no. I, uh, I, did my, I started off in the Th.D., and while I was there, they changed to a Ph.D., and so I took a couple of extra courses to get into the, to the Ph.D. So when I graduated, I was the second Ph.D. graduate. My friend Russ Bush was the first. No, I don't think I knew that. Yeah, Ph.D. graduate, and I had good friends, there, Russ was among them, and we took seminars together. Uh, and while I was still doing these seminars, I'd finished all the seminars, but I was working on my dissertation. I went to uh, Shreveport to become an assistant pastor at Broadmoor Baptist Church in Shreveport. A man named Scott Tatum was pastor. He had been there 24 years. And then Dr. Naylor called him to come teach preaching at Southwestern. And uh, during his first year, a man that taught church history named David D'Amico resigned to go to be at South Main Church in Houston to be a pastor of international ministries where Ken Chafin was pastor. 
down at South Main. And so in the middle of the year, they had a, a vacancy. And Dr. Estep was my, my friend, thought I'd be mm-hmm. a good teacher. John Sullivan, who had come to be the pastor at, at Broadmoor Baptist Church, uh, thought that I would be a good teacher, and he was good friends of Huber Drumright, mm. who was the... So we see all the yeah. politics <laughs> working in here, but I prefer to think of it as, as gracious providences. And Scott Tatum was, mm. was there. And so uh, Russ Bush was there also. He had already begun to teach for a semester, mm-hmm. and we were both very interested in all the inerrancy things that were, that were going. This was what year? This was 76. I began okay. teaching in January of 76. So right. 75, these things were being considered. Okay. And so you knew that of, of these concerns about inerrancy at that time? Oh, yes. I mean, this was a constant diet of conversation for a group of us that, that got together. Mm-hmm. And uh, Bill Hall's article had come out in like in 70, shall we 71, call the Bible shall infallible. we call the Bible infallible? And Criswell had published why I preach the Bible is literally, literally true. true. Yeah. Uh, and then a group of Baptists had said, is the Bible a human book? They came out with this. So all of that mm. was, I mean, this was just really, really tough stuff because there was not a, there was not a commitment to inerrancy in Southern Baptist life in, in general. There were many people who were committed to it and felt that that should be a convention position. There were others who were thinking that it should be something that was up to the individual conscience. After all, this is what Baptist life is all about, liberty of conscience and right of private interpretation and so forth. And to enforce inerrancy on people would be a violation of our Baptist principles. That was, that was their view. And so we had all of these books being uh, written, and uh, this group, which included Russ and me, we would talk about this mm-hmm. all the time. And uh, What was that? At that <clears> time, how, how would you quantify how many people held that view of this is a matter of people's individual conscience over against people that said no? That was mainly, I think, at the academic level, at the institutional level. Uh, people who were in positions of great influence and therefore had some following among pastors, significant pastors would, it, would, it, would hold those views also. People like Cecil Sherman, Ken Chafin, uh, who were very influential pastors at that time, uh, bought into the idea of, of, of this idea that liberty of conscience meant that you didn't have to believe in the inerrancy of Scripture as long as you believed in Jesus as Savior and so forth. So, so what, were, at Southwestern, though, if you just had to render a guess, would you say most of the professors teaching there Uh, held to inerrancy, or how would you assess that looking back? There were a significant number that held to inerrancy, and there were a significant number, I couldn't quantify it beyond that, that believed that inerrancy was not an important issue. Right. So when they they didn't deny it. They didn't deny it. They just didn't believe it was an important issue, and they they bought into the idea that to try to enforce it on people would be uh, counterproductive. Uh, for 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 convention life, it would be develop a split. It would ruin our missions. Yeah, and so one of the first protest groups was the the, the loyalty, the denominational loyalists that right. arose right. because they wanted to protect our missions and bow mission thrust and all of that. And they thought, and so there were a lot who believed that there were. I know there were people that were firmly inerrantists but didn't like the politics, couldn't right. join in with the political aspect uh, of it, uh, and. So it was a, I mean, it was an interesting time. And so, and so you, you and Russ had an idea for a book, right? Right. We had talked about this. uh, Since you were students. Since we were students. Yeah. Yeah. And we had said, they said, you know, if we ever get into the place where we're together and we can spend time, we need to write a book about this. And next year will be the 40th anniversary of the publication of that book. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Zondervan published it originally. It was published by Moody. 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 Originally. And if people haven't read that book, they should have already Baptist read Baptist and book. the Bible. It's called Baptist and the Bible. Right. Yeah. We wrote it because there were conflicting views as to what was the historic Baptist position on Scripture. What was the historic point of identity related to Scripture? Was it liberty of conscience and right of private interpretation? Or was it the infallibility and the inerrancy of Scripture arising out of a firm conviction that it's revealed truth from God. Which one of these is most important Mm -hmm. in Baptist identity? And so Ross and I said the only way to discover this is historically. What have Baptists said? Have there there been Baptist controversies about this? Have there been Baptists who wrote about it? 
Uh, can we gain from history some insight as to how inerrancy relates to Baptist identity historically? And frankly, we knew what we thought, but when we got into the historical material, it was amazing as to mm. how alive an issue this was throughout history from the very beginning of Baptist, uh, modern day Baptist life, I would say, in the, in the 17th century, all the way, all the way through, and of course, most significantly then in the, in England, in the, in the downgrade controversy, and then what happened within American Baptist life with Harry Emerson Fosdick and so forth, and the, and the breakup of that, and, uh, and then what was going on presently in, in Southern Baptist life at the time. This has been fascinating, uh, Dr. Nettles, and we want to continue to, to think with you about that era and what happened and how God uh, guided you through it. So when we come back, we're going to go further uh, into what was going on in your life at Southwestern Seminary in the late 70s, early 80s. If you're not familiar with this book, By His Grace, For His Glory, a historical, theological, and practical study of the doctrines of grace in Baptist life, I want to introduce you to it. It's written by the premier historical theologian among Southern Baptists. Tom Nettles is one of the founding board members of Founders Ministries. He's also the senior professor of historical theology at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville. Tom wrote this book back in 1986 and then Founders Ministries reprinted an expanded version of it in 2006. And we have these books available for you for a limited time on a deep discount of 50% off. And in addition, the first 10 people who order this book will get an autographed edition of it. Dr. Nettles has recently been here and signed copies of the book for us. So I want to encourage you to go to founders.org, go to our bookstore, look for this book, By His Grace, For His Glory, and order it at a 50% discount. Welcome back to The Sword and the Trial. We've been talking with Dr. Nettles about his life and ministry and want to dig deeper into what was going on in your own life and in some of your relationships as this inerrancy controversy pressed on. So you started professor, started teaching as professor of history at Southwestern Seminary in 19... January of 76. 76. 1976. And you had this idea for the book, mm -hmm. Baptist in the Bible, that you ultimately wrote with Russ Bush uh, even before that. Yes, yes. We had been talking about it while we were both in the Ph.D. program and working through all these issues and then uh, had vowed that we would do it one day if we could. In God's mm -hmm. providence, it happened. Uh, when I went back to Southwestern in January of 76, I was finishing my dissertations. As soon as I finished my dissertation, we had a, a, a meal together uh, over at Russ's house, and we began to talk about it. Mm. said, all right, we said we're going to do this. We've got to start. Yeah. And so we started immediately, probably the summer of uh, 76, writing and assigning each other stuff to do. And we would give each other chapters as we developed them. And uh, we were finished with the book probably by February of 79, before we even knew that an inerrancy controversy was about to happen. Hmm. Some people had said they just jumped on the bandwagon and took <laughs> yeah, advantage right. of this. And we had been working on this since the middle of 76 had finished it before we even knew about the, what, what was going to happen. Uh, Moody had consented to, to publish it, and it, it came out right in the spring of 80, mm. just, just right after the, the, the news was out about the conservatives trying to elect the president to uh, make the Southern Baptist Convention an inerritist convention. So Yeah, yeah so had, what was the reaction to your uh, from your colleagues at Southwestern? Um, uh, secretly some would, would commend us. I mean, secretly, what, what do you mean? Well, because everyone was alarmed politically about what had happened with Adrian Rogers being elected, elected with the pastor's conference that year in which was very, very strong. And, you know, like James Robinson calling people snakes and, and cancers and, and all of this, this kind of thing. And people were taking all this very personally. And so, uh, it was a, uh, it was volatile, and to just come out and support what seemed to be a, a tract of the times uh, was <laughs> not something that would have been healthy. But we had friends who said they, they, they commended us, they, they supported it, and, and that sort of thing. But I asked one of my colleagues if he would, he stopped me on the campus one time and was talking about it and thought it was a good book and needed. And I said, well, would you review it? 
for us. He said, oh, no, no, I, I don't think I could do that. I wouldn't have time to go into all the sources and investigate them and make sure that everything's interpreted exactly right. Of course, it's what you, you always do when you review a book. You know, you go back and you rewrite it in order to review it. Um, so, um, but this, I mean, that's, that's fine. Yeah, so what was going so, on, though, with, with people who would secretly say, man, appreciate what you're doing, but publicly you know, kind of pull away? What, what's, what's operating there? I, I don't know. I don't think I've ever figured it out, except that uh, people do um, tend to bow to what they perceive as the dominant power yeah. in, in any kind of organization, denominational structures mm -hmm. uh, particularly. So fear and of man is not something that uh, seminary professors or denominational leaders are not immune, immune to. to it. That's okay. right. That's right. Mm -hmm. And then others, of course, were just upset that we'd even attempted that. Yeah, what, can, what did they say? What did the people well, who, who were I remember upset? Remember, one you? in particular came in and he was acting real frustrated at lunch. He said, and some other some book had come out, and uh, I mean, a, a sermon. Someone had heard a sermon about inspiration, and people were talking about it. And, and I said, well, I think that's ex I think the sermon is exactly right. I think it's exactly <laughs> what Baptists have believed. And he said, okay, so you've written a book about Baptists in the Bible. Tell me, what is the Baptist view? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. <laughs> yes, I said, well, <laughs> I did, basically. I said, we were surprised to find out just how live this issue has been throughout Baptist history and the strong stances. And I talked about Andrew Fuller and what he had, he had written and what, what Boyce had written and brought us and, and um, other, other people. And so, so people were, they were upset by it. Yeah. So... Um, all right, so you have uh, pretty well nailed your colors to the mast at this point as your own understanding of the authority of Scripture at a time that's pivotal in the history of the SBC because now this is the controversy and there's a battle going on about where are we going to stand on this question. Yeah. So um, you probably got some phone calls. I know of a couple of them that uh, you got where there seemed to be some uh, efforts to persuade you to back off of uh, what you were saying. Yeah, uh, and <clears throat> one of these, there was an attempt on the part of uh, someone to organize all the Baptist historians that taught at Southern Baptist seminaries to, to sign a statement about uh, Baptists and liberty of conscience mm -hmm. and the right of private interpretation. I don't remember exactly how the wording was, but it was uh, an affirmation that the, church, that the church historians wanted to make that the dominant Baptist principle had to do with liberty of conscience and, and not uh, forcing people into certain interpretations because this would be a violation of, of the Baptist uh, conscience and this is where we had stood and this was our contribution to modern society and so forth. And so I was uh, on vacation visiting my, my home in Mississippi and I, got a, I was fishing, in fact, and uh, had, uh, uh, someone came down to the pond and got me and we didn't have cell phones then so <laughs> you had to go actually I go to a, a phone I had a, yeah i had a, a request to go and, and, and call one of my colleagues at at southwestern and i called him and he said this probably won't take long this is this is going to be easy we have this and he read it to me and i paused he said well i said uh, i called his name and i said i i don't even agree with that i said i i don't think i can sign it i think it's motivated by trying to uh call into question uh, the people who are trying to argue for inerrancy, and I just don't agree with that position. And so you, how long have you been teaching at this point, Tom? Four and a half, five years, four and a half years. So you didn't so. have tenure? No, not at that time. This is a professor who has seniority over you. Oh, yes. Yep. And uh, so he says all of the Southern Baptist history professors in our seminaries have signed this. Yeah. And he's wanting you to sign it. Right. No. And uh, you said no. I just, yeah, I just. What about your career? Well, I was naive, and I didn't realize it would be any threat to my career. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't understand how things worked then. If I had known more about how things work, I might have been more frightened. But at that point, it was just such a conviction in my soul that I knew that to take any step that would compromise mm -hmm. what uh, I thought was the real issue at stake. I didn't think the issue was liberty of conscience. Probably uh, that document said things you believe. They're true. Oh, it right? did. Yeah. So yeah. the statement yeah. wasn't a direct um, rebuttal of 
your position no, on it. No, no, it, it was wasn't. this other kind of thing. It was just trying to come into the back door to uh, affirm uh, a, a position that would have the effect of saying, all right, our, our leading thinkers in Baptist identity recognize a principle superior to inerrancy. That basically mm-hmm. is what the thrust of it was going to be. And I knew that's the way it would be used. And though it wasn't a direct violation of what I had written, and it was not entirely false in what it was affirming, the political situation, I just I knew what was going to happen, and I just said I couldn't sign it. So you didn't sign it. I didn't sign it. You continued to teach. Yeah. And um, how did that go? It went, as far as I know, it went fine. Yeah. I, okay. I enjoyed it, and, but, uh, and I had, of course, <clears throat> I did get tenure. Mm-hmm. At Southwestern, the the year, the last year that I was there, actually, I got a tenure. Huber Drumwright was uh, the, dean the dean then, a yeah. heroic man, and he actually used. It's, it was interesting to hear him talk, and you know, he, he talked like this, <laughs> brothers. <laughs> we, and uh, he was influenced by W. A. Criswell because he, he was a yeah. member of First yeah. Baptist Church in Dallas, and and. Um, there were the, some trustees were really nervous about giving uh, Russ tenure and giving me tenure. And we had these separate interviews. And in the, the interview, uh, the president and the, 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 uh, the uh, executive vice president, academic vice president, and one member of the trustees were there, and Hubert Drumwright was there, and I was there. <laughs> and mm-hmm. so, so uh, Hubert Drumwright said, brethren, Think of what it would mean if in this situation, one of our two young scholars who have written this wonderful book, Affirming Inerrancy, if we do not give them tenure, what will it say about (laughs) Southwestern? Will it position us in a position we don't want to be in? (laughs) So he was playing all the right cards at that because that was his position. He wanted us there. Yeah. uh, Well, you know, Tom, I remember in 1979... I enrolled Southwestern in May, took the summer term. My first course was with you in church history. And I was pastoring a little church in College Station, Texas, and uh, had a professor, a history professor, one of your colleagues, uh, who was the interim pastor of a church where I'd attended before pastoring in College Station, Mm. Bryan College Station. And so he came down, and all the spring of 79, he's talking about what's going to happen in Houston at the Southern Baptist Convention in June that there's a young man by the name of Adrian Rogers that's going to be nominated as president. If he becomes president, then uh, Southwestern will become a Bible college and all my fac- all my colleagues and I will be fired and we'll no longer have a theological education. The SBC will all be indoctrination, indoctrination. And so he's just creating this apocalyptic vision of what will happen if Rogers gets elected. And so I'm a pastor about to enroll at Southwestern and said, man, I, we're, we're going to get our messengers and we're going to go and, and vote against Adrian Rogers. And so I had uh, Tom for the first class. And after two or three days in that, that uh, eight-week course, uh, several hours a day of lectures, I went up to you and, and said, I'd like to meet with you. So I, I went to your office. I don't know if you remember this or not. I said, Dr. Nettles, I want to let you know, I understand what's going on. I remember. In the, you remember this? <laughs> I said, I know what's going on in the convention. And uh, I'm not going to let Adrian Rogers get elected. You're not going to let let, you know, I got this, you know, I'm bringing, we're bringing messengers. We're going to speak against this. We're not going to let you be fired. And I'll never forget the look on your face. I've seen it since multiple times, but uh, you kind (laughs) of cocked your head and looked at me. You said, who have you been talking to? And Mm -hmm. I said, well, you know, Leon Macbeth has been the interim pastor at the church where John and I got married. And, and you, you got up from around your desk and closed the door and you went and sat down and you begin to educate me on inerrancy authority of scripture and what was going on in the convention. And, you know, that, that was the beginning for me. My mind just began to swirl. And later that year, I had a systematic theology class with Bert Dominey. And uh, I asked a question because I'm trying to figure it out. I don't know. I, I really don't know what to make of all this. I believe the Bible. I just never considered these categories. And I asked a question in that systematic class. And uh, Dr. Dominey, because I, looking back on it, I know now the, the atmosphere was charged politically. He looked at me and said, oh, you're one of those fundamentalists, aren't you? He said, I know. Are you recording this? And he really oh, got upset. He yeah. canceled the class. He said, I can't even continue lecturing today. Y'all yeah. just leave. It was. It was tense. Yeah. It was tense many, many times. And people felt very, very threatened. And 
Um, we, what I did, I went to Huber Drumright. I mean, from that class, I just went, you know, the dean, I didn't know if I could even see him. He welcomed me in, and he gave me two hours. Wow. And uh, he said, uh, he said, there are two men on this faculty. And he, he went through, oh, that was a, a history lesson, a New Testament lesson, <laughs> an Old Testament lesson, a theology lesson. But he said, there are two men on this faculty who understand what's going on right now. It's Tom Nettles and Russ Bush. He said, you need to stay close to them and take everything they teach. And uh, that was the best counsel I ever received in my theological uh, education, and, and I tried to do that. So you influenced me significantly on that point, and yet with this, I mean, other people begin to put pressure on you to not be so outspoken and to, you know, why are you creating these controversies? Why are you digging in your heels here? I know that happened with uh, some of the work in Texas Baptist life as well. Uh, another phone call you got, right? Yeah, they, the um, Texas Baptist Convention had passed a resolution that sort of affirmed the Baptist faith and message of 1963 because of the wording on the doctrine of Scripture left it open for some neo-Orthodox interpretations and things like that. And they said this is, they treated it as if it were revealed truth. God has given us this confession of faith and we need no other con, uh, confession of faith. And uh, so they affirmed it. And I wrote an article called uh, Confessionalism, Creedalism, and the Baptist Faith and Message in which I, I looked at the idea of what a, what a confession is as opposed to what a creed is, mm -hmm. and then how the Baptist faith and message fit in with that, 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 we, uh, uh, that, a, that a confession is always open to being altered from time to time in light of the demands of a historical and theological situation, and that the action the Baptist General Convention had taken was to the, exactly the opposite of what that they had been claiming, that they had, they had made a creed out of the mm -hmm. Baptist faith and message. It cannot be altered because and they, they wanted to protect that wording. Uh, and and the, the, the uh, dynamic at the, at the Baptist General Convention of Texas had been to try to get a strong statement, stronger statement on, in, on inerrancy. Well, I tried to get it published, and the, uh, the Baptist Standard initially said they would publish it. And then I got a letter back saying, we cannot publish it. You can write it as a letter to the editor. And I said, I can't, that's well, a letter to the editor. I can't make any <laughs> arguments at all. It'd just be sort of a, a, a very short opinion thing. And there was, a, um, there was a, another paper called The Southern Baptist Advocate that was being published by Russell Kemmerling. And he was tr really trying to push the uh, inerrancy agenda, trying to get some stuff out there because all the Baptist state papers were against the, against the inerrancy yeah. movement. We, they just didn't have any literature. So he was, he was taking a chance in, in doing this. And so he called me and said, I heard that you had an article that uh, the Baptist Standard turned down. Uh, I said, yeah. He said, would you let me publish it? And I said, sure. I mean, I was young. Anything I could get published was great. I didn't know. So he published it. And then about a week after it was published, I got a call from the uh, executive secretary of the Baptist General Convention of Texas that I had a relationship with because I had written an, uh, a, uh, a speech for him. Mm -hmm. And we had, we had become friendly. And uh, he, pr he delivered that speech uh, at a Founders Day in at Southwestern Seminary. Not to be confused with Founders Conference. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, there are other places where the word Founders is used. Uh, so he, uh, he, he presented that. We had become friends. And so uh, he called me when that article came out, and he said, uh, he said, Tom, you know, uh, why did you publish that article in The Advocate? I said, because he asked me to. I said, I tried to get... Uh, it published in the Baptist Standard, and they wouldn't publish it. But I think it's an important issue. He said, well, Tom, I'm having, I know you, and I, and I know your value uh, to us, and I want to protect that. But I'm having a hard time convincing the people over here uh, that you, you really are on the right side of this. And I said, uh, well, I said, I think I... I, I think I'm saying the right things. I think this is an important issue. He said, yeah, but um, I know you see it as valuable. You see it as trying to protect uh, Baptist life, but that's not the way people here perceive it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Hmm. And I just paused. and <laughs> I'm kind of slow on the uptake sometimes. <laughs> and I, I said, yes, I, I understand what you're saying. Hmm. So what that was he it. saying? That was it. 
he was saying that unless you back off of this, it's going to be very hard for you to convince the powers in the denomination that you're really of value to us. Yeah. So it was uh, uh, not maybe maybe threats too hard over a word no, to it use. Was, uh, he was, I Just think he warning. was letting me know how the political machine works. I think yeah. he was actually being friendly. Yeah, trying to I get really, you to... I don't think he was trying to threaten me. I think he knows how it works. Yeah. And he's saying, you need to consider this because... Uh, As implications think, for your career. He did career. think that, yeah, I mean, I was young. He did think that I had a long <clears throat> time uh, ahead of me and that he would hate to see me see it cut short. Yeah. He was a part of the political machine, but mm-hmm. I think he was genuinely being sincere in trying to give me something else to think about yeah. before I dove off the deep end. So why not, with that, think about, well, yeah, I want to be useful. I want to have a career here uh, in academic Baptist life. And so if I just kind of back off over this way, that will make me more useful over the long haul. Uh, yeah. Why not take that line of thinking? Well, I think there are some things in which you can take that line of thinking on – Points that are that are clearly like uh, disputed points that may not be worth you know if like if I wanted to say dispensational premillennialism is what we should believe and anyone who doesn't should be dismissed. Someone says you need to back off of that. That's you know you don't yeah. need to be claiming that people should be dismissed over that. I would I would reconsider and say okay yeah right. I realize it. But when you're when you're on something like the inerrancy of Scripture, divine revelation, a place from which we get all of our truth, our understanding of God, our understanding of salvation, to say that it's fallible, that's just non-negotiable. Yeah, and so the uh, that becomes one of those things where the the truth of it is so clear, and to surrender it would be damaging to the soul. Yeah, you just you can't. Uh, you have to stand. You have to stand. Yeah, yeah. I mean, who would I be giving Southern Baptists? If I gave them me as a compromise in a compromise position on inerrancy, yeah. If yeah. I saved my career, but I had already surrendered what I thought was the central foundational aspect of how you have any confidence that God has revealed Himself to us and has saved sinners. Yeah, and and it's not like you would just renounce that, but you would just not stand on that and own the implications. That's of right. It. Yeah. So there's a significant uh, issue there that, that confronts all of us at different times in our lives, I think. Are we going to take God's Word seriously and stand, or are we going to try to think more pragmatically and say, well, for the greater good, we're just going to back off and be quiet yeah. here? Yeah. So when did you leave Southwestern? Uh, I left, yes, I taught 76 to 82, and so the after the spring semester of 82, uh, I left to go to Mid-America Baptist Mid-America Theological Seminary. Seminary. Okay, and, and why did you go to Mid-America? Well, uh, the president there, uh, Gray Allison, had uh, contacted me. One time I had turned him down because I thought I needed to stay at Southwestern. Then I got another contact and some thought through it, and I had become convinced that what was going on at Southwestern in light of the tension was a smorgasbord approach to, to theology, that some believed in inerrancy and would support it and some didn't. Some believed in of uh, a more robust confessionalism that others didn't. And so it, the, the theological education at that time was just so mixed that I, uh, I saw an opportunity to go to a place where it was there was unilateral consent to the inerrancy of Scripture, to a confession of faith that they had. And I thought that overall it would be a healthier kind of experience of theological education for the students. And, mm-hmm. and for me. Okay. So you went and, there. Uh, it was while you were at Mid-America that your book, uh, By His Grace, For His Glory, was published, right? Right. By yeah. Baker. Right. I had been working on it already. After two years of teaching there, I had a full year sabbatic, and that's when I finished By His Grace and For His Glory, and it came out in uh, 84. 84. Okay. And so what was the response to that book? Uh, I, it's, it's, well, the immediate response was, uh, when it was presented to me in chapel, there was applause and there was a lot of, uh, c- congratulations and that sort of thing. As it began to settle in on the, the faculty and the administration as to exactly what I was saying and the impact that it was, that it had begun to, to have, uh, there was caution mm-hmm. about it. 
real, real caution. Uh, and eventually the doctrines of grace, particularly the, the doctrine of of effectual calling, the necessity of regeneration prior to repentance and faith became a theological issue. Yeah. There. And so that theological issue resulted in a lot of conversations, a lot of meetings, and uh, right. a recognition now, that... An attempt to uh, ameliorate the situation in some way, to uh, give me a year to try to do better. <laughs> I didn't do better. <laughs> and, By do better, what was meant? <laughs> uh not be so convicted and plain in your teaching? Yeah, I guess so. Not to influence the students as much as I was influencing the, the students. Yeah. I'd made it clear from the very beginning that I was a Calvinist and that I didn't make a hobby horse of it, but wherever it arose in the history of the church and people asked questions that I was going to defend a position that I thought was right. And, of course, mm. it arises a lot of times in the history of the church and a lot of times in Baptist history. And so the the effect of sort of the, the, the years of, uh, testing was that nothing changed. Yeah. Uh, and so I was asked to resign. I have a copy of a letter that you wrote to Dr. Gray Allison before you accepted to go teach there. Oh, you have that? I have, have a copy, copy of, of that, that letter in which you spell out how you understand the Baptist faith and message as it relates to regeneration mm-hmm. and repentance and faith. And that letter was accepted by him. He's that's no problem. Uh, that's because of the ambiguity in the confession of faith there at, at Mid-America. So I wanted to clarify that before mm. I, I went. And he yeah. said, well, it's purposefully ambiguous so that people who are on either side of this can, can, can sign yeah. it. That was So you were asked to resign. Uh, what could you have done to have, been, uh, to have avoided that request? I don't know. You um, could have pulled back and not been so outspoken. I could have pulled back. I mean, those were avenues provided for you. Look, if you'll, yeah. you you can't influence students like this, you can't be associated like you've been associated with certain people. And if you don't, you know, if you would just kind of play along and, and be a part of us and and not be so effective in your teaching, then you yeah, I mean, stay. that was that. I'm sure that was the thinking that, uh, and and I appreciate the latitude that they tried to mm-hmm. uh, to give me. They actually they were trying to salvage my yeah. career and. And I remember Dr. Allison said one time it was, there were a lot of students that were evidently complaining about this and reporting this thing to their pastors as to what was going on. And, yeah. and uh, he said in chapel one time, he says, you students need to be very careful about how you represent what's being taught in class. He says, we've got people who've come here, who've brought their families here. Uh, it could be very uh, damaging, you know, if, if, if something happens where we have to let someone go. I mm-hmm. just want you to be very careful about the way you say things. Dr. Allison was, was, was doing his best to try to uh, protect me. Yeah. Uh, but what happened was there were so many supporters of the school that had no sympathy with Calvinism, who had no sympathy with the doctrine that, that became the pivotal point of conflict, uh, regeneration. Uh, and it, so much pressure came on him that he had to choose either me or the school. Yeah. Yeah, so so he chose the school. You were asked to resign. What year was that? Uh, 88. 88. 88. Okay. So you had three kids? Yeah. How old were they? I'm not exactly. Well, uh, let's see. My oldest at that time was a sophomore. We stayed one more year there without a, without a place to serve. And so he was a junior. He went his junior year. So high school. High school. Yeah. So he was the right. oldest. And then I had a, a an eighth grader. Mm-hmm. And a seventh grader, and so now you're unemployed. That must have been yep. pretty hard. Uh, there were there were moments yeah. <laughs> in which I I wondered. I I I never had any kind of panic yeah. though that that I remember. Um, I had a lot of friends like you and and others that were supportive and uh, encouraging and praying. And so, what did you do during that year when you didn't have a teaching position? I had some conferences in which I was speaking, and I had some book, some articles I was working on to write, and so I just went to work every day at my house. I went to my office, and I uh, studied and, and wrote. Trusted God. Yeah, I trusted God. And then I had an opportunity. There was a, <clears throat> at the same time, well, Ben Mitchell called me, said there's a, an advertisement for a position at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in, in church history. I said, Phew. I'd never fit there. He said, no, give it a try. 
just just write them, just, just send something up there. And at the same time, there was a there was a, a church that was, we're I know we're about out of time. Here. It's all right. No go. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, I sent my my material up to Trinity. They contacted me and wanted me to come for an interview. After I went for the interview, they called me back. They had they had isolated it to three. I went and I taught uh, a, a class there. had a, had an interview with a smaller uh, group, and they called me to come teach. And so you went to teach at Trinity. You stayed there how many years? Eight years. Eight I years. taught from eighty nine to ninety seven. And that must have been a, a, a very invigorating experience. It was. It was, it was a, great time yeah very good well dr nettles thank you so much for uh opening up your life to us letting us think through how god has worked in baptist life here in america uh, from your own prism of experience grateful to have you here